I want to start off by saying this. There is a question the born again ask. All born again ask one particular question. Yet, 90%, 90% of all born again who ask this question never let God answer the question. They never let Him answer it. In other words, they will ask the question and then they will proceed forward. They will ask the question of how will God use me? How will God use me? And many times they will proceed by doing something that God don't want them to do. And fizzle out and quit and be done with it. Well, God's not going to use me. So therefore, I'm not going to do anything. I'm going to sit on the pew and just be a good little church member. And that's my job. That's what I'm going to do. Some do that. Some don't do anything. They say, what, you know, what does God want me to do? How will He use me? I'm going to wait till God decides what He wants to do with me. And He'll tell me. I'm going to pray about it. And folks, I know people right today that are praying for God's direction. And I don't know for sure what they're expecting as a symbol of what God wants them to do um, and how He's going to present that. I don't know. Maybe they're waiting on a light of bolting, you know, a bolting light to come down and hit the ground in front of them and just miss them by half an inch and whoo, all of a sudden they awake and they realize, hey, God's talking to me and then a great voice is going to come down and say, I just wanted to get your attention and here's what I want you to do. Well, God's not going to do that. He's already got a procedure. He already has a way of directing you in what He will have you to do. And a lot of people never answer or let God answer the question that they ask. How will God use me? They, like babes in Christ, exercise their imaginations. Their imaginations. They're not experienced in how God handles things. So they use their imagination. In other words, they take what they think is what God wants them to do and they run with it. And sometimes they don't. Sometimes they sit and they think, well, God will probably one day when the time's right use me in such and such. And they don't do anything else. And sometimes they're lazy and they don't want to do anything else. But the ones that have this imagination in their early years as a Christian maybe will sit around and think, God will make me one day a great evangelist. I will go all over the world and I will preach the gospel of Jesus Christ to many nations and many people. Thousands of people will get saved. And I will be known throughout the world as the greatest evangelist who ever lived. Imagination. Some think... Perhaps God will give me a church and I will be a pastor. And I will stand before great crowds. And I will be such a great pastor that and so devoted to God and so in touch with the Bible that other pastors will ask me to come to their churches and I can, I can lead those churches as well as mine. I'm going to be a great pastor. Imagination. Maybe. God will use me as a great singer. Man, I know when I get in that shower, no one's around, and I got that certain little echo going on in there, and that door's closed. No one's listening, and I'm really bold with my singing. I sound so good that I know God can use that. And maybe He'll make me a great singer. And somehow I'll get the courage and stand in front of thousands of people, and I will bellow out a note, and people will just go, oh, and just shiver all over because of the beauty of my voice. Imagination. Maybe God will use me as a great missionary. You know, after all, the Muslims should be reached for the cause of Christ. Maybe I will find the right angle, the right secret, the right thing that will trigger something in their mind and in their hearts. And I will say it to them. And they'll say, wow, I didn't know that. Now I'm going to become a Christian. And it's all because God made me that particular missionary. Perhaps that's how God will use me. 
in my imagination. You know, one guy thought that he was a great evangelist. And he got up and he spoke in front of a small crowd, a few dozen people. And he was nervous. And I don't know if you ever saw, there's a television show, and I know there's people watching around the world, but there's a television show here in America, or used to be a long time ago, it was called The Ghost and Mr. Chicken. And it starred Don Knotts, the actor. And in that movie, Don Knotts got up before a group of people to give a speech. And when he got up to give a speech, he had his notes in his hand. And while he was standing there getting ready to speak, he was just shaking all over, he was scared. His notes was just going all over the place. And then he laid his notes down because they were shaking so hard. His hands were shaking so hard because of his nervousness. And all of a sudden, whoosh, wind came by and they blew his notes away. Now he's nervous with no notes to read. And he didn't do very good, obviously. Uh, 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 and he gave about a half a second speech. I said, thank you, and he went and sat down. Well, this guy that thought that he was supposed to be an evangelist pretty much imitated what Don Knotts done. He was, first of all, very nervous. Second of all, he was ill-prepared. Third of all, he didn't speak well. And so he went home and he said, but God is going to use me as an evangelist. I know He is. And by the way, this is a true story. It happened in a Baptist church in the south somewhere, which I won't tell you where. And he said, I'm going to be a great evangelist. Whatever I have to do, I'm going to work on it. And so he started watching television evangelists, studying them, their body language, how they presented things, and, and the way they read, and the way they looked into the camera when they would talk and speak, and the fire that was inside of them, and the hand motions that they would use. And one particular one stood out, of course, Billy Graham stood out to him more than the other evangelists. And he said, if I'm going to be a great evangelist, maybe that needs to be the beginning of where I start. I'll start and be like Billy Graham, and then I'll surpass him and be better. And so, he started to mimic Billy Graham's style of preaching. Plagiarism, in a sense. Now, one particular message he liked more than others. And he watched it. And he videotaped it. And he watched it again, and again, and again, and again. Until he had memorized the whole entire message. And he said, now I'm ready. I'm going to go out, I'm going to preach a message. I know how to present it. I know what I need to do to get to people's attention. I'm going to do it just like Billy Graham. But then, when I master that, I'm going to build on it. And I'm going to get better. So he went out. And to this great group of people, this preacher finally told him, he said, yes, I'll let you preach. This guy stood in front of probably about 900 people in this preacher's congregation, and he preached a message. Just so happened, it was identical to the message that Billy Graham had preached. Now, most people there had never heard it. In fact, probably nobody had ever heard it. You know, the Billy Graham classics are some that we watch occasionally, but not everybody watches. Well, he watched it, he studied it, he learned it. And he memorized, and he preached that message verbatim. Didn't change one word. He even got the motions right. Doing his hand like Billy Graham, and how Billy Graham would stand like this sometimes, and stand like this sometimes. And he got all the motions just perfect. And people were going, hey, Amen! Yes! Hey, Amen! Cheering him on. Done great! Wonderful message. Of course, it had been preached by Billy Graham. But they didn't know it. And he was doing good. And then all of a sudden, he asked the choir, now I'm going to ask the choir if they will to stand and sing just as I am. Just as I am. Just like Billy Graham has at his crusades. And the choir stood up and they began to sing. And he was doing good until he got to one place. He had 900 people. They were all on one little single floor. And he preached. And he said this, Well, they're coming down from all over the stadium tonight. Thousands and thousands of people coming down, he said, because he memorized it and he forgot to leave that part out. Then all of a sudden, everybody said, that man plagiarized Billy Graham. His imagination that he could become a great evangelist was just his imagination. And he didn't have what it took. He couldn't be Billy Graham. Billy Graham is Billy Graham. And you are you. 
But how do you know what God's will is for you? Soon. Very soon after our salvation, if you will. In our new life of where we are born again, we try. We begin to try to manage our new life. We try to manage our new life. In other words, this is what I think God wants me to do. And we began to set out on a, I guess, a ministry, a destination, a goal, a path to follow by what we are doing to manage our new Christian life. We decide how much church we need. Well, I need to go three times a week. Yeah, I need to go Sunday, Sunday night. Hmm, I guess maybe I'll just go to Wednesday night and skip Sunday school. And I think that's, that's best because I'll get enough, I'll understand enough. Um, then I can take that information and use it to do what my goals are to do for God. We decide how much church we need. We. We. Not God. We. We know how much Bible we should need to do what we need to do. In other words, you know, I'm going to preach, or I'm going to teach Sunday school, or I'm just going to witness. So the thing that I really need to highlight on in the Bible is how to witness the Romans' roads. And for those that don't know what that is, it is a procedure of how someone can get saved. You've got Romans 3, Romans 6, and Romans 9, and it talks about different things. And Sunday nights we're studying that in case you want to be a part of it. So, they decide this much Bible, this part of the Bible, it's what I need. It's what we decide. Not God. They say, I will study this. And the rest? Well, let's just let the pastor give me that. And if I see that it connects with what I'm doing for God, I'll you know, strike an interest. I'll listen to him. I'll hear him. But if he's preaching on something about Nebuchadnezzar or, you know, something out of Ezekiel or something that don't really apply to me, then I'll let my mind wander during church. And, you know, I'll think about what I'm doing next week and I'll do whatever I need to do uh, to settle things in my mind about things that's coming up. And I'll just, you know, I'll half listen. I don't really need that after all. But I'll decide how much of the Bible I need and let the pastor give me the rest and I will decide if he's given me what I need and yes before you judge what I'm saying preachers should be men who can teach the Bible I know of preachers in my town that I live in many people around the world in North Carolina that are teaching and preaching out of the Bible and have not got a clue on what it means. I have talked to them in different situations and asked them questions. And what they think about this, they avoid the subject. They don't want to talk about it. And I come back to it. They avoid it. And what I have concluded is this. They don't know what I'm talking about. I've had people from other churches in this community to come to me and tell me, you teach. Our preacher don't teach. We don't think he knows what he's doing. But a preacher should be apt to teach us what the Bible says. A preacher should know. So yes, to a level, to a degree, we should allow pastors to teach us. Absolutely. But, for one reason, to point us in the direction correctly that God is leading us. You get that? To correctly put us in the place where God 
is leading us, not us. Not us. Some preachers that do what I spoke of don't know the Bible quite as good as they should in order to stand into a pulpit and preach and teach. In other words, I ought to be able to stand here and teach you pretty much any part of the Bible. And those that cannot do it, listen to this. I know for sure are depending on your ignorance of the Bible to be able to do what they're doing. If you don't know the Bible well, they can fool you. They can tell you something different. So, God wants you to know the Bible. He wants you to read it all. He wants you to know Genesis to Revelation. He wants you to have a regular Bible study alone or together. But a regular Bible study to know the Word of God. Not just what you think you need to know. Sometimes you can read things and they don't make sense now, but suddenly, all of a sudden, they become knowledge to you in certain situations that you didn't think were going to come up. Amen? Amen. Some preachers depend on your ignorance of the Bible. And as many people require, they in turn simply tickle your ears because that's all you want. Tickle my ears, preacher. Don't convict me. Don't give me information that's going to convict my heart and make me feel like I need to do something. I don't like that. That makes me uncomfortable. Tell your boss that at work. See what he tells you. Okay, I won't, I won't tell you what to do. I won't tell you what I need you to do. But uh, do me a favor. Get in your car and go home. Don't come back. You need to know the Bible well so that God can lead you in the direction He wants you to go. It's awful quiet here today. Tickle my ears, preacher. Yeah, and I'll pay you to do it. I'll give you a big salary. What you need, $70,000? Don't you start no trouble. Don't you tell me I need to do this and this and this. Don't you talk about this, this and this. But we're going to pay you well. Where's God at in all this? Amen. 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 Pastors, prepare you to serve God. That's what they do. Why? Because your imaginary ideas when you're first born again are speculations. <coughs> speculations. And we never serve God on speculations. That's not how we do what God wants us to do. By speculating, this is what God wants me to do. You don't do that. You do that, you go down the wrong path. A good pastor prepares you to use, what did the verse say? A good work that began in you when you become born again. You see, God placed the good work in you already. The minute that you become a born again Christian, God has already placed a purpose for you. He already has a desire. He already has a job. He already has a will for you in your life. He already knows what your path is, but most of us never find that path because we are speculating what God wants us to do on our own imaginations. We don't study the Bible. We don't learn the Bible. And I promise you, God will not use a novice. If you don't know this Bible well enough, God will not use you. You learn it. And through it, is how you learn what God wants you to do. The reason this church is here is because of verses that came out of this Bible. There were four of them. I read them. And I was confident what God wanted. Had I never read them, I would have speculated the rest of my life. 
a lot of been doing something. I mean, it takes a willing heart, obviously, and if you don't have a willing heart, there's no beginning. But a willing heart needs guidelines, source, information, pastors that say, hey, God will use you. This is what the Bible said. God used this woman at the well who was not a well-known, reputable citizen. Okay? She was known as the worst citizen. God used Zacchaeus, a little tax collector that nobody liked. God will use you. And pastors need to let you know that and prepare you for that and tell you how God has done this time and time again. But then, it's up to you to decide what God has in store for you by the good work that He has already started in you once you become born again. Many people have been born again for 20, 30, 40 years and still have not acted on the good work that God has given them. And that's a shame. The good work. Not good life. I didn't say that. I said the good work. Pastors prepare you for this and then you're supposed to go out and find it. And you use the good work that began when you become born again. To do what God wants you to do. That good work only comes through Christ. Not the pastor and not your imagination. I've had people come up to me and say, Preacher, I think God is calling me to blah, blah, blah. Okay? Whatever. Should I do that? If God calls you to do it, by all means. What do you think? Folks, honestly, does it really matter what I think if God told you to do it? Amen. No. Does it really matter? No. You could be lying to me. I don't know. Maybe you're trying me out. Maybe you're running a little test. Well, the preacher says that that's what God wants. That's probably what God wants. Then you're depending on me to tell you what God wants you to do. That's not my job. That's not anybody's job. Christ has already put a good work in you. And it's no one's job to find it but yours. Christ is where we Get confidence in serving. Did you know that? Nowhere else. One time I was on the back of a fire truck. A lot of people in my church here know that I was at the fire, or uh, was with the fire department for years, city fire department. And we had, I think, 13, maybe 14 stations in Wilmington, North Carolina. And I was at a particular station, and we always had a Sunday service. Thank God, you know, we had a, a fire chief that was a Christian and allowed it. And they asked me to be like a pastor for the fire department. Uh, some would say chaplain, but this was a volunteer thing. I wasn't a paid chaplain. I was more of a pastor um, for the fire department. And they asked me, will you lead us in services? And I said, absolutely. And a lot of these guys I have seen do some of the most heinous things you have ever seen in your life. Firemen are a special breed. <laughs> okay? They're crazy. I mean, anybody that's going to run into something that everybody's running out of has got to be crazy. I mean, oh, the building's on fire. Man, it's about to fall down. It's burning. Let's get in there. But anyway, I knew these guys. I knew their families. I knew them well. Good people. But I got a little nervous. And I said on the back of this fire truck going to headquarters to present a message to all 13 of these stations that were coming to headquarters okay, for a Sunday message. I was thinking, this is a little nerve-wracking. What am I going to say? I've got to come up with something that's going to be entertaining perhaps, get them laughing, and then tell them this and this. And I said, God, I'm just too nervous. 
you know, these are people I know. It's like preaching to your family. You know, your family is sitting there looking at you like, who you tell them what, you know. And it's hard. I mean, parents, you know. Okay? It's hard, okay, to have your kids stand in front of you and tell you something. Alright? And so I was in front of captains and different ones, and I had to say this, and I was nervous. And I said, well, God, I, I just can't get over this nervousness. I said, I'm going to blow it today. This is my first message. And I heard a voice as though I'm hearing mine speak today, inside, not out loud. It said, look, who are you doing this for? Me or you? And I had to get myself in check. I said, God, I'm doing it for you. Then why are you nervous? If you're doing it for me. I was worried about what they would think of me presenting the gospel. Or was that really my objective? Or was it that I was wanting to speak and be well noticed and liked because of my great ability to speak? I said, God, you're right. And I had prepared a message. And I got up and I let it roll. And it was on the Bible. And it just so happened, God proved that night in a fire what I had said. It's a long story. I can't go into it. But God backed me up. Because once I got in front of the people, I was gone. I was not there anymore. God's representative. God's servant was there. And that's what I do every time I get in front of a group of people to speak. I don't worry about me. I have confidence. I have boldness because that's what God wants me to do. And God wants you to do your job in boldness and confidence and not use. I'm embarrassed. It's, it's, it's kind of humiliating. I don't, I'm a little nervous. How can God use it as long as you're putting that between you and the service that He has rendered for you to do? You mean I can't be nervous, preacher? No, you can't. You can be bold is what Paul said. Speak up and do it everywhere. I get in more trouble at work and other places because I tell the truth about homosexuality and other things. I almost got in trouble in Sunday school this morning. But I got to tell what God wants me to tell. And that's your confidence. Wow. On YouTube, can y'all hear all these amens? Amen. Amen. Thank you. Appreciate that. <laughs> to use good work that began in you, you have to be bold to start with. Because God gave you that good work. It's not something that you can develop and create. It's not something that you make. Something that you refine. It's not repeating a message of Billy Graham and then at the end saying, they're coming down from all over the stadium today. and you know, Thousands and there's not even a thousand people. It's not that way. It's not plagiarism. It's not copying someone else's style of preaching. It's not doing what other people do. It's doing what God wants you to do with the boldness, what's in your heart, the fire that's inside of you that wants to break out and speak up for God. Yeah. Amen. Verse 6 says, being confident. What is confident? Confidence is confidence. Being confident of this very thing that He which began or begun a good work in you will, He will, God will perform it until the day of Jesus Christ. You know this word perform, it has three meanings. Did you know that? He will, and this is the three meanings, He will continue, complete, and perfect hmm, it until the day of Jesus Christ. Let me read those again. Three meanings. Continue. In other words, He'll keep it going. You ain't got to worry about it. What am I going to do? Everybody walked out on me. No one's here to hear me anymore. 
I know how that feels. When we began the church, we had lots of people come and go. Leroy and Brenda's here, and there's been times it was just me and Brenda, and Leroy, and Tracy. And Brenda, did I preach any different? Nope. They walked out on me. But God gave me something to continue on with. That fire was still there. I preached to Brenda and Leroy just like there was a thousand people in front of me preaching. Right now we're reaching thousands of people. Thousands. And my preaching style hadn't changed one bit because it's about God. It says continue and complete. I want to think. And I even asked Leroy the other day, yesterday in fact, is my preaching style changed a little bit? And he said, yeah, a little bit. I want to think that I'm getting a little better at it. I'm getting a little more knowledgeable of things of the Bible. God is completing something. He's brought this, this, and this together to bring me here so that now I can preach this message where back here I couldn't do it. Now I can. He's completing something. And then it says perfect. With age, I'm getting a little better, Craig. A little wiser, a little smarter. Tried that, done that. Watched myself on video and said, that was stupid. I ain't doing that again. Amen. Perfection. Refine. Trying to get a little better. Perfecting, getting a little better. I ain't the greatest preacher in the world by no means because I cannot stand in the place of Jesus and Paul and others. But boy, I'm going to give it all I got. Yeah. Amen. God begun a work in me. And I got to stay with it. And He told me what to do through the Bible. I studied it. I went to the Bible. It told me what to do. I don't know, God ain't speaking to me. How many times you read the Bible this week? Oh, hmm, preacher, I forgot all about I didn't read it all this week. God didn't tell you what to do. Wow. I mean, uh, put y'all in on the secret here. Y'all watch on YouTube. Bible. Open God's mouth. Close God's mouth. God's Word speaking to you through the Bible. You ain't willing to read it? Don't sulk and pout. Just say, I'm lazy. I don't want to read the Bible. I don't want to know really what God wants me to do. But God has already begun a new work. A good work. A great work. Something wonderful. I don't know what it is, but it's been 45 years and I still don't know what it is. And you ain't doing what you need to be doing to find out. Richard, you mean today. No, I'm not. I'm giving you some valuable information that will help you to be what God wants you to be so that you can be blessed and happy and at peace with God. Christ is where we have confidence. Christ must be the power in the vessel. You know, I can take an old cracked clay pot, pour water in there, and those big cracks in that clay pot, it'll leak on it. Because the water inside of that vessel is depending on that vessel, isn't it? But, if God is that water, He has the power to go into that clay pot and not leak out. And to stay right inside of it. He began a new work in you. It's in you. It's not going to leak out. It's there. He wants to complete it. Make it perfect. It's staying right there because it's His power in that vessel. It's not yours. Stop tapping in on your power. 
tap in on His power that's inside of you to do the good work. Get it? Amen. You know, Elijah went to a widow in Zarephath and she had already run out of oil and flour. And Elijah was a bold rascal. He went up to her and said, Hey, make me a cake of bread. I'm hungry. She said, Oh, but I've just got a little bit left. i got a little bit of oil and i got a little bit of flour. He said, If I make you a cake of bread, then me and my son are going to starve to death. Now, what would you do if someone told you that? And this poor woman has done everything she could. She's worked hard all her life. She uh, has run out of everything, no more resources. And she told you, All we got less, one little more so bread. Me and my son, if we don't eat that, then we're going to starve to death. What would you do? You'd say, well, I shouldn't even ask. I'm sorry, I feel bad. Go ahead and eat it and make it. You know what he done? He said, okay, go make me a cake of bread then. <laughs> and I thought, what boldness. What boldness to tell her anyway, even if you're going to starve to death, go do it. And you know this widow looked at him said, okay. Never seen such boldness. Don't know what kind of man you really are. But, okay. And guess what happened? The big old clay pot of flour never ran out. And the craft of oil never ran out. It just kept producing, kept producing. And they ate thousands and thousands and thousands of cakes of bread as a result. Because she'd done what God wanted her to do and the power that was within God kept things going. Just like it can inside of you with a good work that God has already placed in you and given you. That's good news, folks. The born again must let Christ be the leading power inside of them. Not their speculations or their imaginations or their wants. God must be the power in them. We must remember we are born again a second time unto God. Yeah. Rebirth means everything now is past. It's over. Doesn't matter what people think about you. Doesn't matter what you've done. You're reborn. You're, you're ready to start all over again. A new work, a good work has begun in you. Once you become born again, you can be what God wants you to be by the power in the vessel. Isn't that good news? Once our new life begins, be assured, our Father wants His thoughts and His ways to become what defines us. Us. He wants us to inherit his ways. Chapter 2, verse 5 of Philippians. It says, Let this mind be in you, which is also in Christ Jesus. Same mind. In other words, start to think like God thinks. And how do you think like God thinks? You know God by the Bible. You know, you know what this tells us? God's personality, the way He thinks. How many of you in Sunday school, and I know on YouTube y'all can't see this, but how many of you in Sunday school have learned more about God's personality based on our study in the Bible? You know more about God's personality, right? Amen. And that's what this does. Our mind is in you now that is in God. That's what He wants. God began a new work, a good work, or a work that defines his ways and his thoughts in you. And God alone, God alone knows even the thoughts that you had in your past and what hinders you. Other than you, God alone is the only one that knows everything that you've ever done. And God knows how to fix that and make you something different. God alone, no one else. You know, Rachel, I can't cover up things. God can erase them. It's amazing. 
Remember the woman at the well? It's like he erased her past. Everyone still knew what she done, but somehow it didn't matter anymore. God can do that. A good work began in her. God alone can correctly direct your path then, right? No one else, including you. It all comes and starts when you become born again. How? You're a sinner. Just tell God the truth about that. God, I am a sinner. And I've done a lot of things that I'm not proud of. Somehow, God, there's something inside of me that convinces me you still love me. I don't know why you would. But you do. And God, will you forgive me? And his answer would be yes, I will. Will you take me? His answer would be yes, I will. I'll take you. Can I start again, God? Yes, you can. You can start again. It's called born again. God will forgive you of your sins. He died to pay for them so that they're gone. So that you can be a new creation in Him without your sinful past. He rose again the third day to sustain it and represent it and secure it. And all you have to do is have faith and receive it as a gift. And folks, I don't know what could be easier than doing that. But it has to be Sincere. Sincere. And if you can do that, right here, today, right now, you can receive Jesus Christ as your Savior. Start all over again. And a new work, a good work can begin in you that you can go out and become a new creation in Christ. One prayer. God forgive me. I know that you died for my sins. I accept your gift. Take my life and use it for your own glory. And believe it. And God will do it. Amen.